Rowanna Morgan, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for coming on to Radio Richard. Hi, Radio Richard. Good to speak with you. Yes. So, so what I really would love you to do, Rowena, is um, sadly, you're not a, an international star to the general public. So I'd like you just to tell a little about not only what you do now, but start with where you started, because you've the, the reason I wanted you to come on this show is because you've had so many um, jobs in the music industry. And I wanted somebody <laughs> who was not as boring as watching paint <laughs> dry talking about the business and you're certainly anything but boring so so <laughs> start out, where did you start out in the business and and, and t tell some of the some of the positions you've held and it's going to be a bit like a Richard Curtis movie what I'm most known for is being the musical geisha Mrs Fixit of the music industry for everybody Correct. that's what I'm known for originally I started in radio when I was about 23 um, and it was a really random thing. I'd actually been trying to get into radio for years, uh, couldn't get through the door under any circumstances. This was back home in North Wales. And then one day this guy got a show and I could hear what he was doing. And I thought what he needs is people to phone in his characters. I'd been brought up to um, don't complain about something, do something about it. So I thought, okay, I will ring up and be a character. I've been making parsnip soup that day. So I rang up as a character, the High Priestess Sophia, literally making it up as I went along. And uh, I was all, felicitations, I am the High Priestess Sophia. Um, and my catchphrase was always, may your parsnips always be blessed. And that ended up becoming a catchphrase throughout the Northwest. Off the back of that, became a regular on the show, married him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and um but i had the straight job in our relationship he said there was only room for one of us to work full-time in reindeer i thought oh, i was going to be married and have babies i got married got divorced no babies and i thought that was the end of it for me because i was in my 30s by then um <clears throat> and ended up working in america did some stuff for the bbc from there even covered the presidential elections of 2004 for the bbc and offered them an interview with a young man called Barack Obama. I said, trust me, this boy's going places. And they said, no, we don't want it. <laughs> and, Typical. Typical. It, 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 it's my Beatles and Decker story. Cause you know that if I'd have done that interview, me and Barack, we'd still be like this. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So came back to Britain when my visa ran out. And, you know, by this point I'm, 35, not expecting anything good to happen in music wow. at that point because I'm a woman and I'm too old and blah. And lo and behold, when I was at 39, going through one of the worst bits of my life ever, I lost everything, my relationship, my home, my job, all in 48 hours. Nice. Yeah. And um, thanks to Facebook, I turned it all around inside of 30 days, uh, got a new place to live and ended up getting one of the best jobs of my life working for what was known as Basket, the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers and Authors, now known as the Ivers. Today, they're actually doing the Ivor Novello Awards. So this couldn't be more timely, could it? Right. Um, um, my, they were looking for somebody who was business development, but could also understand what people within music are like and handle them accordingly. Mm. And I was dealing with all the classical composers, jazz composers, songwriters of every genre, and my personal favorites, the media composers, because um, they're like a little bit of both. They're composer and they are uh, little businesses, every single one of them. Their brains are wired that way. So my brain fit very well with them. But you could go from talking to a super duper pop star one moment to talking to a very crusty classical guy the next moment and um, dealing with all their particular issues and needs and so forth and <clears throat> created wonderful things from that. Off the back of that, another mutual friend of ours, Guy Barker, mm -hmm. um, who lives around the corner here. Yes, indeed. Uh, he said, uh, if you ever, you know, if, if you ever do a night in, in 
for us composers, you have to do it at this pub around the corner. And then I moved to Chiswick. So it was like, uh, hey guy, it's happening. I'm now your neighbor. What was that pub called? And that became orig that became the Geisha Nights, the musical Geisha Nights. And it was uh, originally just meant to be about seven composers and songwriters, including Pete Woodruff, producer and songwriter with Def Leppard, uh, Guy Barker and yourself and about four or five other people. And I think you might have been at the first one. There was 30 I was, or I, w I was at the first one. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, we had um, Tony Visconti's children there, Morgan, another former Chiswickian, M Morgan Visconti and Jessica Lee Morgan came yes. to that one, which was a real shock. And it grew uh, when the Music Producers Guild got involved. Did, and did, now did, yes. I had this night with producers and songwriters, composers and right. artists, and, like, right. and it grew. It went to Metropolis, we yes. did it at Tile Yard Studios, we did right. it at Strong Room Studios, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's more I like think, virtual creation now. <laughs> I think you got me involved with the Music Producers Guild when it was forming, so I was a member of that, and uh, yeah, but here's the thing that I find interesting about all this. So, Go on. Rowena, you are, you called yourself the musical fixer kind of person. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested now in what you think of the state of the industry now and how you might fix some of the things that are very seriously considered by many musicians, especially younger musicians who are trying yeah. to break into the business, how you would fix them. First of all, what do you think is the current state of the business? Uh, I think the state of the business is appalling. Uh, and I actually did a little bit of research before this from my people and said, what do you think is the state of play and what do you think can be done to help? So I got some good information from good people. My personal viewpoint with the music industry is uh, particularly with the majors, is it's awful. It's a bit like um, the environmental disaster that's, you know, climate change. Everybody's going, that's somebody else's problem. It'll, it, it, these things have happened before. It'll take care of itself. And it's getting to the point, there's a tipping point where there's no recovery from it uh, unless we do more stuff to mm. help the environment. I feel mm -hmm. exactly the same about the music industry. The music industry is, you know, there's so much of, you know, I, I can tell you without naming names of big people in the business who are earning half a million a year on the business side of it. Talking, somebody mentioned at a party where there were some non-music people, one of the non-music people said, oh, oh, what about so-and-so, a major artist over here who headlines and stuff. I, I don't even want to think about somebody that small. And um, the, there's so much focus on the money but there's not enough focus on the music and it's being done in a very short-sighted way. There's a very good band that had um, a great first album. They had a, a great second album. And on the second album, they had a huge hit. You know, they were having hits, but then they had this really major hit and that became a problem for them because when it came to the third album, uh, they came up with a great third album, absolutely great third album, People from Glastonbury came to the studios to see them recording it, said, oh my God, this is great. We'll have you headlining at Glastonbury. What did the record company do? They dropped them because it said they said it, the whole album did not sound like that track that had become their biggest hit. Exactly. Where would the Beatles be? Where would um, U2 be? The, the, right. the, the, where would Madonna be? Yes. Every artist that's ever survived did yes. it by not doing a repeat, well, you know, of what they've done previously. So, yes. well, I, I mean, as you know, as you know, Ryan, I've, I've been in the music business professionally for over 45 years and yeah. and I've seen pretty much every side of the music business. I've seen it as a as a signed artist. I've seen it as a songwriter. I've seen it as a producer. I've seen it as an arranger. I've seen it from all angles, and I can tell you that every single time, it is not surprising that the music business only thinks about money. But here's the difference. You know, uh, a, a lot of people say, well, the old days were better because, okay? Now, 
in one respect, I'll tell you why I think the old days were better because, because in the old days, there were A&R men who knew about music. I mean, yeah. Quincy Jones was an A&R guy. I mean, yeah. you know, Arif Martin was a, was a, was an A&R man. You know, these, the people, the, they knew what they were listening to and they could analyze it and judge it. And they had the good sense in those days to be able to recognize art and, you know, don't buy a dog and bark yourself and let them get, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but the, the later experiences that I started having, certainly I started in the seventies. And then as time went on, I noticed more and more that they were only looking for what had gone before and not looking for the, for a new thing. And that's no. one problem, but there's a bigger problem as well. And I want you to address it. The nature of streaming, which I think is a major controversy today, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, has made a business where, in a way, the business only makes money. In other words, let me put it this way: labels make fifty-eight point five percent of of money that comes in from streaming. Spotify, for instance, to, as one platform have 29.38% of the revenue. That leaves 6% for what they call mechanicals, which I don't understand how you can have mechanicals with Spotify because there's another. And, and no, no, six, I, I, I hear you. 6.12 for performers. So the money that actually, we all know, it's, a, it's everyone talks about it. The money that actually trickles down to the performers, the songwriters, and even the publishers yeah. is microscopic. Now, it, it is. I, why, I, I, why? Tell me why that that situation exists. Why was that allowed to exist? Right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just finish up on what I was talking about and then I'll deal with it. Okay, please do. My, please do. My worry with artists in this current situation uh, where it's like, no, we want your entire next album to sound like something you did on your second album is it creates a situation <laughs> where you haven't got sustainable artists. So at the moment, we all know that there are bands from the 70s, and the 80s and the 90s still touring. If you're only getting two albums out and then they're complaining that your songs don't all sound identical, mm -hmm. then you're not going to have a, a longevity of career. Yes. So it's creating too much turnover of artists. And when you combine that with the payola situation of getting your records played on radio anyway. Indeed. We're ended up with a situation where it's just R&B music from America because the majors, you know, et cetera. Uh, there's a sci-fi series I, I love called Firefly. And in that, there are only two cultures that survived, America and China. And as we know, there are artists in China which are bigger than Madonna. We're gonna end up in a situation where it's just R&B from America and music from China if we're not careful. And I mm. want a rich tapestry of music out there. Of course. I don't want that. So going back onto what you were saying about streaming in general, I, I remember in the, like one of the, in my first six months at Basca, we had this big massive meeting on, you know, the majors had got behind the streaming platforms. Everybody was unhappy about what was going on. You know, the, at the time people were getting paid 0. 0.0003 eighths of a pence per stream yes and there, there's some mathematical shenanigans where they say actually that's better than what you get paid if you're on the radio yeah right but it is definitely so, not yeah i know i know because the amount of artists i know who are well known and still haven't earned a penny from spotify is ridiculous <clears> you know <throat> and there are people that you know as well um so one of the things that came up when I put this out on Facebook so as I could get some good, accurate information was lovely James Wiltshire, who I think you should get on your show, who has been working with Dan Gillespie from The Feeling for the film of his stage play, Jamie. Everybody's talking about Jamie. Yes, yes indeed. He had, he had <clears throat> lots of really good stuff to say that uh, Victoria Horn is sharing out because it was just so good. Mm. But basically, what he pointed out was, and he had the actual percentages, and he said, the uh, majors own X amount of music. Yes. The, indep the independents own actually a lot more. So the independents need to 
uh, band together more so as they can actually go, hey, Spotify, we've got all this. Good and thing. it's already, since that was posted on my page last week after you asked me to do this, that information has started spreading around and people are starting to act on it. So, you know, vote James Wiltshire for president is what, yes, what, what yes. I should say. And I've said for years, if what was happening in music happened with lettuce or with cars, everyone would have taken it more seriously. But there's Certainly. this whole kind of disassociative thing of, oh, that's music. Oh, um, you know, why should we pay for it? You know, I buy a picture, I get to keep it forever. They don't get licensing. They don't understand any of the stuff to do with royalties no. and licensing. No. So the answers are coming from a, an incorrect place. Indeed, indeed. I know writing a hit is like writing, like choosing the winning numbers on a lottery ticket. Just to clarify this situation with streaming, yeah. I, asked you, I asked you the question. I mean, that's really interesting what James Wiltshire said, and I hope that bears fruit. But what's also interesting to understand is the the money that people get paid for instance from radio play from tv yeah. from film yeah. that that musicians publishers songwriters performers get paid for those areas is all prescribed in law it's yeah. all there and 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 it's reasonable it may not be as much as they like but it's it's reasonable and it has kept people in careers lucrative careers yeah. uh since the 1910s but but what's happened now is Spotify is a is a change in that. That's something different. And why was it allowed? Because the uh, licenses were given by who? They had to be given by the the uh, master rights holders, which is the the labels. And the labels, as I said earlier, and I'm going to say it again because I'm boring, fifty eight <laughs> fifty eight point five percent of streaming revenue goes to the label. So they thought. I'm all right, Jack. Cool. You know, that's great. I don't, we don't care what anybody else says. And Spotify taking a, a, a massive 29.38%. Now you might say, well, it's their platform. It costs them a lot of money to keep it. Yeah, but look at how much the actual creators of the content, if we have to call it content, yeah. are making. Yeah. It's minuscule. So who it, allowed it? Who allowed this system to be legal? I'll tell you. And so I, I've always said, and you, I need you to tell me whether it is possible to actually legislate a different percentage, because nobody's going to get rid of streaming. Streaming is well, here forever. I, I, but how do we legislate different percentages? There is actually stuff going on at the moment within Parliament uh, where they are looking at the unfairness <clears> of these rates. So um, this is something which is starting to be taken seriously and looked into. And um, gosh, you know, music in Britain was turning over revenue of something like four, 40 billion, something like that, where you factor in all the, um, um, every aspect of it from um, festivals, concerts, every aspect of it. It was bringing in something like 40 billion a year yeah. and yet, of that, how much of that is actually going to the creators? Because you've got the problem with events with secondary ticketing. Secondary ticketing is a huge problem. Uh, an artist puts a t um, sets a ticket rate that is fair, then your ticket masters and everybody else buy up huge blocks of it in the first minute, and the artist may have sold the, put the tickets out at £37.50, ticket master selling it at £200. Mm. That money's not to the artist. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, it's not that the artists are being greedy. Exactly etc is being greedy and it's just such a it's a vile situation it is a vile situation it certainly is and I, and I certainly hope that there's some way that new rates can be can be negotiated but not only that legislated because until it's yeah. law you know the way the world has always been Ryan and you know it as well as I do is that the big very wealthy people who have the biggest guns win wars uh, yeah. And so, and so the the record labels have the money to go and 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 lobby Parliament and the Congress, um, and and yet and yet you know ordinary musicians don't. Now in my in my business as a producer and you know kind of creative young man, 
I see loads of young artists and I've seen them for years and they just have no way in. They can't, they find a way to chisel their way in. And right. well, that's I, one I, of the I, reasons why I think your, your expertise in networking is so great. But, but this is a big problem because financially, even in terms of money, it seems to me that the, the record industry, the music industry needs new blood. They need new ideas. They need to not sound like the last record. Yeah. They need to have artists who want to find something new. And yet those artists are constantly being, as you quite eloquently explained, chucked out and said, oh, no, no, not that. We want to have something that sounds exactly yeah. like let, this. Let, let's face it. The 60s had a sound, the 40s had a sound, the 50s had a sound, the 60s had a sound, the 70s did, the 80s did, the 90s did, and then we get to the noughties. How much has music changed in the last 21 years? Exactly. Very little. Um, and if people just keep hearing something that sounds the same, sounds the same, sounds the same, it's, like it's going to end up sort of like, you know, people like eating porridge for breakfast, oh. but if they knew they had to eat it for every day for the rest right, of their life, exactly. they might and, not like porridge so much. And, and on that point, it's I find it interesting that in in the sort of jazz world, the, there have been some incredible creative breakthroughs, but look at who they're from. They're yeah. from Jacob Collier, who's just a complete stone cold genius, and a group Dirty Loops. And both of those people were given their chance by Quincy Jones. Yes. Uh, so in other words, a, a massive amount of hard cash had yeah. to go into allowing those people to be creative. Elton John's first three albums were flops. Right. Uh, but the record company believed in, in him enough that yes. they got him to the fourth album and then everything changed. Yes. There's an awful lot of marketing that goes with getting an artist out there. Uh, a couple of people who've been to the Geisha Nights in their younger days, who are now successful, are uh, a young man called Jack Garrett and a young lady called Freya Ridings, uh, who, um, beautiful stories with both of them. And I, I love the fact that they both, I've watched them both. So I know that an overnight sensation takes 10 years. I've seen yes, it. Myself. Yes, indeed. Now with Freya's situation, she ended up in a, um, uh, like she'd been to the Brit school at 16 she came to a Basker event she opened her mouth and sang and played the guitar and every jaw dropped could she get signed no her father who's quite a famous actor he's actually the voice of daddy pig in nice. Peppa Pig oh that's my um, favorite show I love that show <laughs> well he's the sweetest guy in the world and thankfully had quite a lot of experience and has been writing songs for years himself which is how we got to know each other um he told me the story that she was 13 one day said mom dad can i sing a song for you and they were expecting a 13 year old girl to sing a 13 year old girl song she'd written it she played it she sang and they both looked at each other and went oh my god our daughter is incredible supported her through all of this supported her through the brit school sure. supported her through the rejection and then a wonderful thing happened which goes to show why signing with a major isn't always the best idea in the world so None of the majors would, would touch her. She wasn't quite right for them. What, as you know, if you get signed to a major label and you're a young artist, what they do is they go and say, write with so-and-so, write with so-and-so, write with so-and-so. They get you writing with 20 different writers, totally dilute anything that's unique about you. Yes. And they go, ah, it's not really working. And right. you've wasted two years of your creativity Indeed. on something that is just death failure. Indeed. What happened? With Freya is because she got signed to a smaller label, they let her do what she wanted. Of course. And as a result, she got instead of her having like twenty one way splits on her songs, yes. she's written them. Yeah. She's she's composed them and she sings them. So she's getting a much better percentage back on everything that she does. Yeah. She's got her sound. And um one of her songs got featured on that awful program Love Island. Next thing you know, the, the it's getting played everywhere. Second mm. song comes out, does really well. Third song, really well. And then she came out with Castles. And as soon as I heard it, I said, that's going to get you a Brit Award. Wrote it on a page. I was so pleased. Fantastic. And lo and behold, she was up for a Brit Award earlier right. this year for that right. very song. And I'm so, yeah. she's got multi-platinum around the world. See how 
you know, if there are people who are listening who are young artists, take yeah. courage from that story right. because majors will leave you as indentured slaves, you yeah. know? Yes, and, and what you've touched on a point, which is, is something that concerns me a lot, which is that this, this idea of having seven people or nine people writing a song, how on earth are you going to get originality that way you don't write songs by committee i mean oh, you know I, even even i mean i i've talked to a lot of the original motown guys and even though there was a company attitude to motown they would have songwriting teams small songwriting teams and production teams who yeah. had their yeah. own had their own thing you know holland dozier holland songs didn't sound like Smokey Robinson songs didn't sound like, you know, so so they had a wonderful uh, attitude of let's and then they would they would bring the songs every week into this meeting where all of the songs would be listened to and they talk about them. They said, wow, that one really that's that should be the first thing. And it was great, uh, but they don't have those kinds of companies no. anymore. And and the record labels, as I say, those kinds of A&R guys just don't exist anymore. I mean, I, I also, I mean, there's so much we can talk about, Rowena, and, and it's, it's <laughs> this is all, all fascinating. But what I want to talk to you about now, because I don't want to miss out hearing your ideas on this, the whole concept of publishing, I know you have a lot of experience in publishing. And uh, there are those of us who are podcasters um, and some very, very, uh, useful, interesting, fascinating uh, people doing a great job at spreading information about about music. Uh, so for, for instance, Rick Beato and myself, who are constantly getting slammed with copyright uh, infringement notices from publishers, because they say, Oh, no, you can't use that song. Now, I, for instance, in my, you know, I have 20 years of making documentaries on the BBC, and the BBC used to pay all the licenses. Yeah, yeah. For, for using music, but in in any case, we we wouldn't pay. Uh, in my documentaries, I didn't play the whole song. I just would play a bit of the song, and I'd talk about it and give some background and historical details, and I'd interview right. people, and I still do that. But we are constantly getting hit by uh, from YouTube. If I put something up on YouTube saying. Nope, you've you've caught you've infringed copyright. We're blocking your video. Well, and, and 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 to me, there's this there is this thing called fair use, which says that if you're using uh, yeah. the music but, for an educational purpose, it should be allowed. Now, about fifty percent of my videos they allow the fair use, and another fifty percent they don't. And and what do you know about this thing? What I can say, just to show you how infuriating these things are. And that a lot of it is because bots are doing the job, not right. a human. Yes. Is I, um, one of the many hats I wear now is I'm a, a, also a social media manager for a couple of artists who shall remain nameless because people need to think it's the artist that's speaking, not me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I'd, uh, I'd I, rather I, have you speaking. Yeah. Oh, bless you. But I, I've ended up experiencing the crazy situation of imagine like when I'm doing that, I'm literally being the artist. So I, as the social media manager representing that artist on their channel, yes. go to put their music up on their Instagram and their TikTok page yes. and it gets blocked. It gets blocked. It's their music. And I'm literally messaging back, hang on, this is my music. And they're going, we, we don't care that you say it's your music. Well, well there's two things here, Rowena. There's the, <laughs> there's the master rights holder of the recording, and there's yeah. also the publisher. Now, your artist may be their own publisher. If they're not, then it may even be, and I've had this before with my own music, that the publisher of the music stops it. No, no, it, they're, they're their own publisher and everything, which makes it completely infuriating. And yes. you can't get to a human to resolve the issue. What's brilliant is I've got um, the video chopped down into three different clips. Sometimes they'll let one of the clips up, but not the other two. It's the same song by the same artist who is his own publisher, and they'll block one, but not the other two. 
Yeah. There is no rhyme or reason to it. Apparently the bots kick in after six seconds. I've heard. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, but so yeah, if you're doing, yeah. Uh, I'm part of a group on Facebook uh, for women in entertainment. And every now and again, I'll see somebody post up. Does anybody know somebody at Instagram that I can speak to? Does anybody know someone at TikTok nice. that I can speak to? So it was certain situations with much more major artists can be resolved because it even with major artists they're having these problems with their work yes they are publishers want out there you yeah. know they're trying to promote themselves and they're being thwarted from promoting themselves via box mm. so um so some of this stuff where they're saying you know you can't use that might not actually be correct because you've got a bot yes. giving the answer yes yes that's true and tell me this if you have the artist and the publisher's permission to yeah. use the clip and and even the record labels how do you how do you tell them that how, i mean i i've tried but they just yeah. ignore in, in a world of bots i i think we're just occasionally going to be banging our head against brick walls but actually um there's something i've recently become a brand ambassador for which is quite interesting uh, which kind of ties in with all of this. Um, so I've recently become a brand ambassador for a company called Tag Mix, and it's very clever stuff, right? It's witchcraft in a box is what nice. I'm going to describe it nice. as. That connects to the sound guy's desk at a concert, okay? So we've all been in that situation where, um, you know, you go to a concert and everyone's got their phones up filming it, and then they share the, it on Facebook and yeah. stuff like that. And the sound quality is not great. Well, what these clever guys at Tag Mix have done is this little box goes, gets fitted to the, the output from the desk. Um, when you want to share a 30 second clip of that concert, you can um, embed it with the actual music in that moment right. from the concert without any of that external noise. So it's great for artists, it's great for venues, because it helps promote both in the best possible way. Right. They then put the whole concert available on Spotify. Wow. So as you, everyone can promote said concert, go, you should have been at this concert. I love the fact that it is something that can help add to the revenue of the artist, right. providing right. we can put Spotify out. <laughs> right, right, very interesting. Very it interesting. is interesting. And this, the guy behind it is a guy called Andy Kane, who worked with Texas on that Ivor nominated song. You can say what you want, but I won't change a thing. I yeah. feel the same. That yeah. song. I know so that he song. worked on that with them. And then he went to live in Ibiza. Uh, nice. And he just became aware. Everyone was sticking their phones up. They yes. weren't looking, yes. at, looking at the phones. <clears throat> right came up with this as a solution that Great. could be helpful for artists. So yeah. I'm very passionate about this and I'm very no, it's delighted. A great idea. Great yeah. idea. If I'm enthusiastic about something, it's because it's good. But I, because thankfully I've got integrity, etc., uh, authentic authenticity. When I yeah. get passionate about stuff, people believe it because it is coming from a place of this is real, this really is good. So uh, that, it's, it's nice that in a world where there's so many things wrong uh, in the music industry, that's something that is actually a good thing. Right. Um, you know, and as uh, our mutual friend Daisy Shoot said to me when I was talking to her about it, she said, all artists want their music to be heard at the best possible way. Of and if course. people, do, you know, if, if you've got a way where it can be shared around on social media, it sounded brilliant, that's yeah. only going to you for the better but i also like the thing it's just 30 seconds so it's not stealing the whole thing you know no. it's not like somebody's going into the cinema and secretly filming the whole film badly no, you know? no of course not i mean one of the questions that they ask on youtube is could could the music that is that you are putting on your video be a substitute for buying the original thing and i said well if the original piece of music is seven and a half minutes long and my my section that i'm playing is 42 seconds i don't think so and since i'm talking over the music i don't think so uh, you know yeah. but, but, they, but as you say it's bots and so so you can't talk yeah. to a bot uh you no. can you can only spank it <laughs> 
There are days we want to spank these bots. They're very yes. naughty bots. Yes, very they are. I have to get that in. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> As the as the vicar said to the actress. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, Rowena, I'm going to ask you just to to uh, round off our little discussion, which I hope is not the last we have. I hope you'll come back on the show. But Definitely. I'd like you to just give one little bit of advice to a young, talented person. Gee, they've written some great songs. They they think they everybody thinks they have a great voice. They want how do how can they break in? How can they create a, an actual career? It's like medicine. It doesn't do any good in the bottle. If you've got the great song, you've got to get it out there. Now, um, I think the best advice I have heard was actually from a lady with the most magnificent name that escapes me at the moment, but she used to be the manager for Coldplay. I was at an evening where she was speaking and that kind of question was asked and she came up with a really great answer. H how do I get signed up? And she went, I wouldn't even bother trying to get signed. What I would bother with is try and get a following. If you get a following, the, the, the labels will chase you. And she's absolutely right. There's um, a good friend of mine called Steve Fairclough, wonderful guitarist, demonstrates for Fish, Fishman guitars? Fishman, yes, indeed. Yeah, he, he's, um, he, he was originally pitched as the white BB King when he was 18. Nice, nice. A young, a young guy from Bolton. <laughs> hey, up, blood. Yeah, yes, that's exactly it. But he is a beautiful guitarist and a beautiful human being. And um, he was telling me stuff about uh, a guy who was a great guitarist, tried to get signed, uh, nobody, no, nobody wanted to touch him. So he put what he was doing on YouTube and he was doing guitar lessons on YouTube, guitar tutorials. Before you knew it, he had over a million subscribers. He now posts that he's doing um, a guitar clinic in the day and then he does a concert in the evening. As a result, he was getting, you know, he was making, a, he, he makes a wonderful income from all of this. Next thing you know, the major's going, oh, all the same people who turned him down course, are now course. chasing him. Of and course. he said, what have you got to offer me? And they told him, he said, well, I'd be earning less money if I do that. So exactly. I'm steady. So create the following. You have to create the following. Um, the majors, it was a thing of you had to have a minimum of 5,000 or 8,000 followers on Twitter right. before they'd even talk to you. And they've got to be real followers. Get people talking about you. Exactly. And the way you get people talking about you is by being different. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Know, Who knew? Hey, there's, oh, there's this guy, you know, he's doing a gig down the pub tonight. He, he sounds just like everybody else out there at the moment. Exactly. That is not what's going to get people talking about you. Stand right. out being different. And on the subject of wonderful people who are a bit different, I've got to plug a few friends of mine, one of whom, I well, two of whom I think I've got a record deal for. Um, one is a young lady called Bronwyn Lewis. She's an incredible lady. If you've watched the film Pride, she's the one that stands up and sings this incredible song called Bread and Roses, which gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, she was on The Voice. She was on one of the last episodes of it when they were choosing who they wanted. Everybody thought she was amazing, but they all couldn't pick her for different reasons. And it was heartbreaking. She persevered uh, during lockdown. She went viral on TikTok for translating uh, pop songs into Welsh. Nice. And it went viral. She's been on um, uh, Radio One on The Breakfast Show. She's been on Woman's Hour. Nice. <laughs> and she's got a new album coming out at the moment that uh, and what she's doing for this album is incredible i'm so proud of this girl she carried on fighting a good seven or eight years before the what pendulum swing in her favor a so very lovely Robert, story and one other is um uh ajay shubastava who is incredible session guitarist with jamiroquai gregory isaacs everybody um born and bred in North London and has worshipped Keith Richards, worshipped Filthy Guitar. He has managed to blend his Asian background with his love of the Delta Blues and nice. has come up with some incredible music. And look out for these people. 
do yeah. something different. Send me links. <laughs> send me links so I can put them. I will send you words. links. Send me links and then send me sausages. <laughs> Bro, well, link, sa link sausages. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, oh, oh, that's oh. all right. It's it's a dad joke. It's a dad joke. <laughs> it is a dad joke. It's a very yeah. good dad joke. <laughs> well, Rowena, it's been fantastic. Thanks for being on the show. And please say goodbye to everybody in Welsh, please. Uh, Beautiful. That's the first time we've had anybody speaking Welsh in in our in our show. And so. Oh, Pop is happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rowena, thank you very much and good night. Good night. Bye bye, everybody. Radio Richard. Like, share, subscribe, even donate. Radio Richard. Be informed. Be amazed. Be inspired.